Good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Lanier. I'm assistant pastor here. And good to be with you all this morning. If you would, turn with me to the book of Isaiah. <clears throat> this will be, uh, if you're using the Pew Bible, it's page 611. We've been working our way for the past several years through a series in Isaiah. And uh, we're, we're getting there. We're getting there. Today we find ourselves in chapter, chapters 50 and part of chapter 51. So again, it's Isaiah 50. It's page 611. Please stand for the reading of God's word. Thus says the Lord, Where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? Behold, for your iniquities you were, you were sold, and for your transgressions your mother was sent away. Why, when I came, was there no man? Why, when I called, was there no answer? Is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem, or have I no power to deliver? Behold, by my rebuke I dry up the sea, I make the rivers a desert, and their fish stink for lack of water and die of thirst. I clothe the heavens with blackness and make sackcloth their covering. The Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught, that I may know how to sustain with the word him who is weary. Morning by morning he awakens, he awakens my ear to hear as those who are taught. The Lord God has opened my ear and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. The Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like a flint and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment. The moth will eat them up. Who among you fears the Lord and obeys the voice of his servant? Let him, walk. Let him who walks in darkness and has no light trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. Behold, all of you who kindle a fire and equip yourselves with burning torches, walk by the light of your fire and by the torches that you have kindled, and this you have from my hand. You shall lie down in torment. Then chapter 51, listen to me, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham, your father, and Sarah, who bore you, for he was but one when I called him, that I might bless him and multiply him. For the Lord comforts Zion. He comforts all her waste places and makes her wilderness like Eden, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her, thanksgiving and the voice of song. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation, for a law will go out from me, and I will set my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation has gone out, and my arms will judge the peoples. The coastlands hope for me, and my, for my arm they wait. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, look at the earth beneath, for the heavens vanish like smoke, the earth will wear out like a garment, and they who dwell in it will die in like manner, but my salvation will be forever, and my righteousness will never be dismayed. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. Fear not the reproach of man, nor be dismayed at their revilings, for the moth will eat them up like a garment." And the worm will eat them like wool. But my righteousness will be forever and my salvation to all generations. This is the word of the Lord. Be you may be seated. About two years ago, for the first time, and I hope, or at least as far as I can tell, hopefully the last time, I was almost beaten up by a sweet grandmotherly lady on a bicycle. And the town where we used to live overseas, I would bike to work, and as you're pedaling pretty fast, or if you go running or so forth, you get a bug in your mouth, occasionally you have to kind of spit to the side of the road. And when I did that, all of a sudden, this lady comes past me, older lady, and in my defense, I think she had an electric motor attached to her bicycle, but she was passing me and just screaming at me. I didn't know what was going on. And then I realized, oh, wait a second, I just may well have accidentally spit on her. Now, you know, in most cultures, spitting on someone is one of the worst things you can do, one of the most disgraceful and shameful things you can do. And in our passage this morning, we see that God will actually raise up, has raised up 
his servant, someone who will actually go to such lengths to bear our disgrace that he would even be spit on for us. And if we have someone who has done that, who has such, in such a way borne our disgrace, then we have no reason to, to live in fear. We have no reason to live in that disgrace anymore. And this is a, a long passage which lots of sort of twists and turns that we won't be able to cover all of them. Uh, we will work through it in a few steps. We'll take a look at how it reveals the disgrace of our sin, how the servant steps in to bear that disgrace, and how then we can live free of it thereafter. So it starts with a fairly bracing, almost taunting kind of uh, metaphor, illustration at the beginning in verse 51, or 50, chapter 1. God, the one who created marriage, the one who has entered into a marriage of sorts with his very own people, now declares that he has divorced them. And in a culture where no-fault easy divorces are sort of no big deal, that may not seem like that big of a problem. But if you've ever been through divorce or if you've been impacted, in some, impacted by it in some way, you know that it is not a laughing matter. Read again verse 1 with me. Thus says the Lord, where is your mother's certificate of divorce with which I sent her away? You could actually translate that, with which I divorced her. Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? So let's orient ourselves to this passage here. If you've been with us for the past few weeks, you'll know that we're in the book of Isaiah. God is writing through Isaiah, the prophet, to his people. So the your here would be the historical Israelites. The mother is kind of an interesting metaphor. Throughout the Old Testament, in a few different places, we have uh, the city, Jerusalem, or Zion, which is the mount upon which the city was built, is often referred to as the mother of the Israelites. You see that both in the Old Testament as well as in uh, Jewish literature after the Old Testament. But we also see, for instance, in Hosea that Zion or Jerusalem or the collective people of God are also the bride of Yahweh. They're, they're his, he's, he's in some sense married them. Now, here he is saying that he has divorced them. And you may, you may notice that there's this certificate of divorce here. This is referring to legislation from Deuteronomy 24, earlier in Scripture, where someone who is divorcing a spouse would write down the reasons for it on that certificate and then send them away, divorce them. So it's a painful image here where God is divorcing his covenant people. It's one thing for one celebrity or, a, you know, a, a, I guess the home flipping TV show where they're divorcing one another. It's one thing for, a, for a Angelina Jolie to divorce Brad Pitt. It's another thing for Yahweh to divorce his people. And why has he done this? In verse 2, he says, Behold, for your iniquities you were sold, and for your transgressions your mother was sent away. Now, Isaiah doesn't detail it out here, but we see it elsewhere in Isaiah. We see it throughout the Old Testament. What are these iniquities and transgressions that has resulted in this divorce? Well, it's uh, literal idolatry, the people of God creating you know, golden calves and other such things, wooden trees to worship. Uh, they have engaged in witchcraft. They have even engaged in burning their children as sacrifices. They have withheld justice from the poor. They have been backbiters and slanderers and adulterers who fornicate with people literally and metaphorically. And they are a picture of us. And God says, I have divorced you for this. And let's reflect for a minute on the implications of our iniquities and transgressions. It's easy, and I don't know where we get this from, if we get it from sort of a secular, a kind of a common secular view, but it's very easy for us to over-spiritualize spiritual things to over-spiritualize spiritual things, to think that your own sin is entirely a personal, private thing. That whatever you do on your own time, as long as it doesn't hurt someone else, it's just, just you, or maybe you and God. The problem with that is that it is a massive lie. In fact, let me show you a picture of what this divorce looks like. This is a carving that's coming up shortly. There we go. It is a carving from the palace of Sennacherib, who was the king of Assyria. And this is when they captured the Judahites, the Israelite people, from the city of Lachish, which is southwest of Jerusalem, and this is dated to 701, which is exactly when Isaiah was writing. This is what the divorce looks like. This is what their sins and transgressions looked like. You notice there's a family there in the front. Those are the Jews carrying all their stuff. You have an Assyrian behind the, the bulls there with a whip driving them forward. The lie that our sins are an island to themselves that don't impact other people and children and, and those around us is a complete and massive lie. I was reminded of this recently, well not somewhere, a couple years ago. We had a community group uh, before we came to Florida and we spent a semester 
where each of us would share uh, sort of our life story. And as a parent now, with a few kids, it was, uh, it was very bracing to realize that everyone in the room, myself included, had a, had a tale of how their own parents, their, how, how the sin patterns of those in their family, brothers and sisters, or aunts and uncles, grandparents, whatever it may be, had profoundly impacted them. It didn't stay just a personal thing. But then they realized how that sin pattern in their own lives has then impacted other people. See, the, the truth that we have to realize in this divorce imagery here is that not only are we impacted by other people's sins in the room, but our sin, sins impact them as well. We are in this kind of peculiar way in this together. But not only that, not only is there this horizontal impact of this divorce with God, but there is the divorce with God himself. You notice that he is the one who can produce a certificate of divorce that says, jilted lover, abandoned at the altar, victim of adultery, my own people have left me. And who is this God? Where he says in verses two and three, is my hand shortened that it cannot redeem? This is him talking to the people. Have I no power to deliver? Behold, by my rebuke, I can dry up the sea. I can clothe the heavens with blackness. He says, look, was I not enough for you? Were you not impressed was my ability to control creation and save you out of Egypt and all these things have, I've done, is that not enough for you that you have to turn away and go and prostitute yourself with these other things? It is a disgraceful position that we are in. It's bleak, actually. In fact, we stopped here, leaving it as divorce, and that's, uh, that's it, that God is done with his people, then we would be in a bad way. But thankfully, God doesn't stop there. Isaiah doesn't stop there. He shifts once again to the servant figure. We've seen this servant show up a few times in the past 10 chapters, gradually taking shape. So the servant occasionally is, is something like his people, it's Israel. Sometimes the servant is Isaiah himself. And, but we've seen this deliverer figure, this shadowy guy waiting on the wings, taking shape. And he shows up in this passage as well. Now we know it's him because in verse 10 he says, Who among you fears the Lord and who obeys the voice of his servant? So seemingly out of nowhere, the servant steps into this situation of divorce. And in fact, four times in this section, and depending on which translation you have, you'll see it um, capitalized in different ways. In the ESV, at least, you'll see four times he refers to Lord, lowercase, God, uppercase. And that is Adonai, which is the general name for God and his power. And then it's Yahweh. So sometimes it might be Lord, Lord in your translation, but the all caps shows that that is the marriage name of God. That's his covenant name of God. That's the special name he had with just his special people. And so we have this interesting situation where this Yahweh has actually just divorced his people, but he's acting through the servant to get them back. And that is a profoundly gracious thing. So let's take a look at verse four. What does the servant say when he comes on the scene? He says, the Lord, the Lord, Lord, or the Lord God has given me the tongue of those who are taught that I may know how to sustain with the word him who is weary. In the midst of these divorce parties, the servant steps in and he says, I bring a word that will sustain or comfort, depending on how you want to take that, those who are weary. Now, insofar as we are both instructed by the servant's example and also both in and represented by the servant, there's a very specific application of this that I want to make. In recent weeks, no doubt, many of us, uh, perhaps most of us and those around us have been very wearied by events. Um, they don't have to be named specifically, but various things specifically coming at the federal level have left many of us with a profound sense of alienation, discouragement, happiness for some, despair and you know, lack of safety for others, and it impacts all of us in various ways. Now, everything we do at River Oaks Church from the pulpit and community groups and men's and women's ministry, the children's church and all of that is all oriented to cultivating us as, and I love this phrase from Isaiah, as those who are taught. It's the servant here is the one who's been taught, we are the ones who are taught. Is, you could translate that one who is a disciple, one who is a pupil. Now, we, as a spiritual church, we're not necessarily telling you everything you should believe about every issue. That's between you and God and your conscience and how you read scripture. But what we do do is equip you to take the truth of the living God in any relationship you have, and it could be the person next to you who is profoundly broken by recent events or happy about them. And you could be in this situation where you could be tremendously hurt or have this sort of uh, pridefulness about what has been going on. And in all those situations, you hold to your conviction, but you do so with love to those who do not share it. You see, the servant comes on the scene and he doesn't berate people. He doesn't come on the scene and mock those 
who disagree with him. He doesn't come on the scene to heap scorn and abuse, to question their motives or their integrity. He comes on the scene to those among us in your community groups, your neighbors, down the hall from you at work, who could be tremendously hurting, who are weary and downtrodden, who, who the, the toxicity with which we are in right now, this swirl of issues, revealing that underneath it all, there is a profound sense of divorce from one another and divorce from God and brokenness. And he speaks into that situation with a word to sustain the weary. He sustains them with words from God himself. He upholds them in the weariness and the burden and the brokenness that we are in. So our hope is, as we try to cultivate you as those who are taught, that your first instinct, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's in a conversation with a neighbor, whatever happens this week, that your reaction is one of love. With those, especially with those who disagree with you, that you can sustain and uphold them. Put, shake hands and say, look, we might completely disagree, but I love you in Christ, and we are part of one body, not with words of scorn or mocking. The servant takes action. What gives us the ability to do this, to, to sustain those who are weary? And we have arrived at the center of this passage, which is painful and beautiful at the same time. And in fact, it anticipates what we're going to see in two weeks as we get to the climax of the life of the servant. But we have a taste of it here. So go with me to verses six and, excuse me, five and six. The Lord God has opened, this is the servant speaking, the Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious. I turned not backward. I gave my back to those who strike, my cheeks to those who pull out the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and even spitting. God has just said that he's divorced his people for not listening to him, for rebelliousness, and he's sending them out to be struck and beaten down. We saw a picture of that, right? And the servant says that he has an open ear to listen, that he has not been rebellious, but what does he do? He's the one that steps in between that whip and the people. He says, I will bear that on my own back. I will not turn away from the disgrace and the shame and even the spitting. Now, if we take the mother Zion idea, if we take the servant bearing disgrace and we put those together, we actually have a very clear picture of what ultimately Jesus comes on the scene to do. Turn with me to Luke chapter 13. And if you're using the Pew Bible, this is on page 873. Now this mother Zion idea Although it shows up fairly often in the Old Testament, it doesn't get a whole lot of airtime in the New Testament, which is pretty interesting, but it does show up in one key place. Halfway through, and you can go to verse 34 in chapter 13, halfway through Jesus' journey from uh, Galilee, which is where he had done most of his ministry, and he's going south, and Luke famously does this over 10 whole chapters, about halfway through, he addresses Zion from afar. He's not there yet, he's going there. And here are the words he says, 34 and 35. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. God is divorced, right, in Isaiah. The city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, that's one of the reasons why God did that, right? How often would I have gathered your children together? In Jesus' ministry, he comes on the scene to end the divorce, to bring the children, the Israelites, the people of God back to him. And notice the imagery here. As a mother bird or hen gathers her, her nestlings, her brood under her wings and brings them back in. God, Jesus comes on the scene as the servant to, to end the alienation, to bring the wayward, to bring us back to God. He says, you were not willing. It's a plural you actually. So he's not addressing Jerusalem now, he's addressing the little chickadees. He's addressing us. Like a child who discovers their own will, as happened in our household recently with our 16-month-old, when the mother calls for them, the mother bird trying to gather them, and they realize, oh, I'm going to look back, and I'm going to laugh in your face, and I'm going to run the other direction. My wife's laughing. She saw this happen just the other day. We, all, we don't naturally want to be gathered by God. And in fact, that, it's sort of cosmic insurrection wrapped up in chubby cheeks and diapers, but it's a terrible offense to God. And so Jesus says, behold, your house is forsaken, the divorce continues. And I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, or you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. What's he referring to there? This is a quotation from Psalm 118, and it shows up one other time in Luke. Flip a few pages forward to chapter 19. Jesus is now at the end of that long journey from Galilee downwards. He's arriving to Zion, he's at which he addressed from afar in chapter 13. Now he's arriving there, and we read in verse 37, as he was drawing near on the way down the Mount of Olives, 
the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen, saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. That's the same thing Jesus had said in chapter 13. Although they're so excited, they actually put the word king into it. They're quoting the psalm, and they say, The king has arrived. This should have been the great climax. The reconciliation. We're reconciled to one another and to God. The problem is, in a few chapters, this very same group of people would be gathered by Pilate, along with the religious leaders, and it's the most terrifying adverb, and if you don't know what an adverb is, you can ask Siri afterwards. The most terrifying little word in Luke, up until that point, until Jesus is dead, where it says, the religious leaders and the people, these very same people who had proclaimed him as king, together, jointly, shout, crucify, crucify. And you know how the story ends up? Jesus, what does he do? His back, he turns his back to his captors. He is flogged for us. The one who has come king in the name of the Lord receives a crown of thorns. And yes, what do the, servant, what do the uh, soldiers do? They strike him on the face. And what do they even do? They even spit on him. And I'm not so progressive and enlightened to think that if I hadn't been, if I'd been there, I wouldn't be there with them together shouting, crucify. Probably would have been. It's a horrible reality to think about, actually. And in that moment, when the servant stared the disgrace of my sin and your sin in the face, in fact, took it on his face, took the spitting that we deserve and bore it on his body, he was winning something for me and for you. And what is that? Well, go back with me to Isaiah 50. So go back from Luke, back to page 611 in your pew Bible. The servant appeals to the Lord, Lord again, two times here. And he says that he knows that even though he is willing to undergo this disgrace and even be spat on for us, he says, I will not ultimately be disgraced. Read with me verse 7. But the Lord God helps me, therefore I have not been disgraced. He's willing to undergo the disgrace, he's not ultimately been disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. Why? He who vindicates me is near. Now we're going to come back to that word in a minute. Who will contend with me? Let us stand up together. Who is my adversary? Let him come near to me. Behold, the Lord God helps me. Therefore, who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment and the moth will eat them up. So the servant says he's going to go and do this, but God will not allow him ultimately to be disgraced. And there's two reasons for this. Now this phrase, he who vindicates me there in verse 7, that's a perfectly fine translation. The underlying word there can mean that. Uh, but if you're in the room and you have a King James in front of you, I'm going to go with the King James on this one. Uh, and it's fine if you have a King James. I like the King James. Um, this phrase here, the specific verb form here, and in fact how the Jewish uh, Greek writers ultimately translated it, which then impacts how we see it show up, for instance, in the letters of Paul, uh, I think should and can be re uh, rendered here, here, he who declares me righteous, as opposed to he who vindicates me. It's a more specific nuance. He who declares me righteous. Or, as you see it oftentimes in the New Testament, he who justifies me. In fact, that's how the King James renders it. Uh, and it makes sense here. The servant has borne the disgrace of the children mother Zion, and God declares him, the one who is drawn near to him now, who is reconciling the people to himself, declares the servant righteous. The parallel phrase to this is in verse 9. It's the same verb form, but it's almost the opposite verb. He says, who is the one who will declare me guilty? So you see there's God declares you righteous. Someone else can declare you guilty. And he says, if God is near me and has declared me righteous, there is no one who can actually step up and into the courtroom of God and say, no, you're actually guilty. And boy, is that not a beautiful relief. The servant says that he is bearing our disgrace, the burden of sin that separates us from God, but also poisons every aspect of our relationship with one another that leads to that picture we saw from Sennacherib's palace. And he says that anyone who can step up and declare you guilty is gone. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus the servant. If God is for us, Remember the one who justifies me is near? If God is for us, who can be against us? Who shall bring any charge against us? It is what? It is God who does what? Justifies. Who makes righteous. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who has died. That's from Paul. And if you believe in him, then you died with him too. And if you died with him too, then everything that is true about the servant who has been spat on is true about you as well. And this is the word of peace. Peace. 
the word of the gospel that we minister to those who are weary to sustain them. Many of us, all of us, those around us, carry around with us various sources of disgrace, perhaps shame of, of what you are and what you aren't, uh, maybe something in your past that if someone found out about it, perhaps metaphorically, but maybe even in certain parts of the world, literally, and maybe even on college campuses, literally spit on you for it. And the servant says, I have borne that for you. And if that's true, then who is your adversary? Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? And he says, no one. And if the servant has so borne our disgrace as to free us in this way, then we should live that way. So in chapter 51, we have three calls, three commands to hear or listen. The first one is in 51 verse 1. Listen to me, and he's speaking to us now, you who pursue righteousness, you who seek the Lord. Look to the rock from which you were hewn and the quarry from which you were dug. Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you, for he was but one when I called him that I might bless him and multiply him. And during the baptism uh, earlier, David mentioned this promise to Abraham. The, the servant here, or, the, or Isaiah, is saying, look, if God can so marvelously work to bring millions of people and life and the promise out of a barren 100-year-old man and a, an infertile quarry named Sarah, then how much more has he worked in your own life? Whatever you're going to face tomorrow morning when you go to work, whatever the latest crisis is, a sick kid or a deadline at work or, or health issues, whatever it is, and those are all legitimate, he said, look, look to what God has already done. No matter how many... And, and, and the weight of this is serious, so I'm not downplaying that, but however many things you're facing in your life, they can never outnumber the ways that God has worked already in your life. He says, look, look back to what God has already done. The second, give attention, or listen here, is in verse 4. Give attention to me, my people, and give ear to me, my nation, for a law will go out from me, and I will set my, light, uh, my justice for a light to the peoples. My righteousness draws near, my salvation is going out, and my arms will judge the people. Now, there's a whole lot we could go into with this. But God declares that he has sent his Torah, his law out as the light to the nations. He says, look, don't walk by your own light. Walk by the light I have given you. You can rest in the word that I have given you. If you need to, what do you go to sort of comfort the weary? Where do you go to comfort yourself? You go to the word that I have given you. It is your light. And then finally, the final listen here is this in verses 7 and 8. Listen to me, you who know righteousness, the people in whose heart is my law. That's a stunning little phrase that if you connect it to other parts of the, New, the Old Testament and the New Testament, the sign of the new covenant people of God, the sign that Jesus has done his work is that the law is no longer on tablets of stone, but on your hearts. And he says, for those people, so this is you, River Oaks Church, fear not the reproach of man nor be dismayed at their revilings, for the moth will eat them up like a garment. But my righteousness will be forever. This is a word of comfort to all of us. If the servant has stepped in to bore the, rich, the reproach of man and their revilings, then that means that we do not have to fear them anymore. And I want to make a very specific application, particularly to the young folks in the room. Can you imagine, now that I have kids, um, if I were in your shoes, what it would be like to face what you will face for Christ. It's mind-boggling, actually, to, to think through what the reproaches are, the revilings. This applies to all of us, of course, but in particular to those who are coming up now. For those who are going to hate everything you believe in. It's not just sort of, hey, let's have potlucks and do church. Everything that we believe in about the servant, about Jesus, is something that makes people want to spit on us. And I want to encourage you that the fuddy-duddy folks like me and others in the room, even if we don't fully understand exactly what you go through each day, we're on your side. And we're here to help and sustain and encourage you to face a fight that we didn't have to face as difficult as you are. And I want to encourage you that we're in this together as a church to encourage you not to have any fear of the reproach of man for Jesus, knowing that God is going to take care of business. Those who attack his honor by attacking you will be eaten up by the moths and God will take care of that. That's not our job. Our job is simply to cling to the servant because the servant has come and he has gathered the rebellious children of Zion. He has ended the divorce between us and between us and God so that we do not have to fear the reproach and the revilings of man. They have fallen on his back. He has been disgraced so that we 
have no fear of disgrace. Let's pray. Gracious Father, it's a sobering reminder in this text, both of the problem of our own sin, the opposition of those who attack you, but also of the glories of the servant, Jesus Christ, who has borne all of it for us. As we go out of here, we pray that you would lift us up, comfort us in our own weariness so that we can go and comfort others. In Christ's name, amen. Amen.